Along the Rio Guadalquivir, Andalusia's great river is Cordoba. Today, the former caliph's residence of the Omayyad is a lively city. But it also has an historic past. In 152 BC, the town was founded during the rule of Claudius Marcellus. At that time, the Roman conquerors named it Corduba. Later, the town became the capital of the province of Baetica, the hot southern region of Spain. At the beginning of the 8th century, the town became the headquarters of its recent conquerors, Arabian governors and emirs. Even today, the architectural influence of the Moors is visible. Abd al-Rahman I founded an independent emirate, the empire of the Omayyads al-Andalus. He made his home in Cordoba. In the 10th century, the town reached the zenith of its prosperity. It is believed that almost a million people once lived in the Mecca of the West. The Great Mosque, today's Mezquita, was extended and enlarged during that time. Marble, jasper and granite columns decorate the beautiful interior of the mosque that contains 800 columns. During three periods of construction, the former sovereigns of the Orient created a magnificent prayer hall. Replacing several columns, a Renaissance cathedral was built in the center of the former mosque, a symbol of Christian victory. The cathedral was built in the 16th century. However, its central features appear to conflict with the rest of its interior. During a visit to the town, King Carl V noticed that the altar and choir area were elements that were at odds with the overall interior design. There was also a Jewish quarter in the old town of Cordoba. The beautifully decorated facades of the houses are a popular motif on postcards. One of the three last Spanish medieval synagogues is located here, in Judaria. Between the 10th and the 15th centuries, there were more than 20 Jewish synagogues in this city. Cordoba's former cattle market 
the Plaza del Potro, and its fountain that dates back to the 16th century, is one of the city's most famous attractions. At the old inn in this square, the Posada del Potro, Cervantes, the world-famous author of Don Quixote, once slept. Now it features exhibitions and concerts. Roman, Jewish, Moorish and Christian influences interact with each other in this historic city. Various museums provide a fascinating insight into the city's history. The museum, located in the northeastern part of the Mezquita, contains numerous discoveries from the rich cultural life of Cordoba. The exhibits range from the Bronze Age right up to the time of the Moors. Valuable objects from Madinat al-Zahra, a palace district some several kilometers away, are part of the museum's unique exhibits. The administration of those of different cultures was not an easy task. This was especially so during the time of the Roman Empire, when the Jews were considered to have equal rights. Under the subsequent rule of the Visigoths, the Spanish Jews, or Sephardim, were cruelly persecuted. Thus the Jewish community later supported the Islamic conquerors with military assistance. Consequently, the Arab rulers were sympathetic to the Jews and Sephardic culture continued to develop. And after only a few years it flourished. The conquering of Cordoba in 1236 by Fernando III, the Holy King, put an immediate end to the once glorious and tolerant Caliph town. However, it was King Alfonso VI who ordered the construction of the architecturally plain Alcazar de los Reyes Cristianos in 1328. The Spanish monarchs remained here some time after the final battle for the city of Granada. Even today, the beautiful and vast gardens of the Catholic Royal Palace indicate the tasteful style of the Renaissance.
1486, the famous explorer Columbus was received here by the Spanish king. In the garden of Alcazar in Cordoba, a collection of sculptures recall that historic event. Because he wished to find a new western sea route to India, Columbus asked Queen Isabella for her support. At first, there was little interest in this idea. Only five years later, in 1492, after Columbus had asked for another audience with the Queen, she approved his daring undertaking. Later, the Alcazar was the residence of the Spanish Inquisition. Today, the rooms of the palace contain precious furniture and also some fascinating archaeological finds. The town's various cultural attractions are extremely popular. For the young, and indeed all those who visit Cordoba, there's a lot to discover, including its zoo. Elephants, baboons and lions are some of the zoo's exotic specimens. They highlight the region's proximity to the African continent. The warm, dry climate of Andalusia is the ideal environment for many animals whereas some, such as the wild boar, seem uncomfortable in the heat. The botanical garden is also well worth a visit. May is considered to be the most beautiful time to come here. Then the land is fertile and the air is full of the sweet aroma of a seemingly endless sea of flowers. The Museo di Etnobotanica features the history and development of the most important and agriculturally richest area of the region, the valley of the Rio Guadalquivir and the Sierra Morena. Several kilometers within the mountain region of the Sierra, beyond the borders of the city, is this beautiful monastery, the Monasterio San Jerónimo de Valparaiso. This idyllic monastery is close to some ancient ruins, a fine array of palaces that date back to the time of the sultans. Some sections of the monastery were built with material from the remains of the magnificent residence of Caliph Abd al-Rahman III.
Madinat al-Zahra, the floral town. This was the name of the former Andalusian Versailles that today looks more like a huge area of ruins than a beautiful palace. Since 1910, the archaeologists from all over the world have worked here and uncovered countless historic treasures. In the 10th century, work on this fairy tale residence took almost 25 years. More than 10,000 men worked on its construction. Thousands of marble columns that came from Roman ruins once decorated the palace. The splendor of this residence was short-lived. At the beginning of the 11th century, this floral town of Madinat al-Zahra was destroyed by the Berbers. The old town of Granada extends across three hills, Sacromonte, the world-famous Alhambra and Albaycin, a once densely populated Moorish district with almost 30 mosques. For several centuries, around 60,000 Moors brought this maze of alleys to life, but only a few of the historic Islamic buildings and mosques have survived. Under Mohammed ibn al-Ahmar, the al baythin district lost its importance as a resident for the city's rulers. Mohammed I, the founder of the Nazri Days dynasty, ordered the construction of Alhambra. After Granada had been conquered by the Catholic kings, only the Arabian Baths, El Banuelo, survived in this part of the town as the architectural and cultural bequest of the Moors. After the Reconquista and the decisive military victory of the Christian army over the Islamic Nazri days, several churches and monasteries were built, such as the Monasterio de la Cartuja in the northern part of town. The Carthusian monastery emerged during two long building phases. The monastic church and the cloister were designed in Renaissance style at the beginning of the 16th century. The Chapel of All Saints and the richly decorated sacristy 
were built in the 18th century. According to art historians, the sacristy is the culmination of Churigüerism, a Spanish art form similar to Baroque. Houses in Granada's city centre are surprisingly elegant, plain yet beautiful. It's a good idea to leave the tourist trail and to stroll through the tranquil lanes and enjoy the full atmosphere of the old town. While the Hospital San Juan de Dios has cared for the sick and poor since the 16th century, the Hospital Real is now the university's administrative centre. Located in the northern part of the town, the building has at times been a hospital for the poor, a general hospital, an old people's home, and also a hospital for the mentally handicapped. The beautiful Jardines del Triunfo Park is an ideal place in which to relax and recover from the hustle and bustle of Granada's busy streets. The park's water features and fountains are especially popular. It's a small park, but the water features are quite fascinating. sunny everyday life, the intimacy of the street cafes and the city's historic sites enjoy much popular appeal. Everywhere one can relax in restaurants and cafes and observe life in this unique and attractive Andalusian metropolis. The quantity of historic sites in the town are quite overwhelming to those who come here for the first time. And the famous bullfights of yesteryear still exist today and are just as popular. The old Arabic al Kaitheria silk market was rebuilt after a devastating fire in the 19th century. Within its narrow arched lanes, the ancient atmosphere of the former bazaars lives on. The road to Capilla Real, the impressive tomb of the Catholic monarchs Fernando and Isabella, now travels through Granada's former silk bazaar. Fernando and Isabella chose this town because it was here that their bitter enemies, the Moors, were banished from the Iberian Peninsula forever. Enrique Egas designed this building. 
The interior of the chapel and its decor are quite magnificent, abundant with gold and certainly fit for a king. As Isabella died in 1504, followed by the death of Fernando in 1516, and construction of the chapel was incomplete, their bodies were temporarily laid to rest within a monastery. However, in 1521, the earthly remains of the two sovereigns were finally taken to the late Gothic Capilla Real. The main mosque of the Nazridays was once located on the site of the cathedral. It is believed that its original architect was also Enrique Egas. However, in 1528, Diego de Siloé replaced him. For 30 years, de Siloé, an early master of Renaissance design, constructed a large cathedral with five naves. This cathedral is regarded as one of the most beautiful of its kind. Another artist, Alonso Cano, also influenced the wonderful decor of the interior. He painted Mary's seven women and also designed the main façade of the cathedral. In addition to the artistic design of the Cathedral Santa Maria della Encarnacion, it also contains several paintings by a number of famous artists. However, the town's most well-known site is the highly acclaimed Alhambra that majestically towers above the ancient town. According to legend, the Nazarite Palace was built during the night with only torches as illumination. This could be a possible explanation for the name of this monument, the Red. It is more likely, however, that its name relates to the location of the palace, a red-coloured iron-bearing hill, although the flag of the Nazri days was also red. The Alcazaba, the former fortress district, is the oldest part of Alhambra. This military area dates back to the time of the Ziri days. However, in 1238, Mohammed I extended it. Carl V, the grandchild of Isabella and Fernando, was highly impressed by the Moorish residents but he wanted to add another building to the former court, an imposing Renaissance palace. The building, influenced by Italian design, was never completed, 
Nevertheless, it is one of the most important buildings of Spanish High Renaissance. The Hall of the Ambassadors, on the ground floor of the 45 meter high tower, the Torre de Comares, is an artistic masterpiece. The Nazari Day's rulers, Yusuf I and Mohammed V, created a wonderful oriental synthesis of the arts. A luxurious palace that is evocative of the 1001 nights, architectural perfection and more beautiful than any other of Spain's Moorish buildings. In the 14th century, Granada became one of the last refuges for several Islamic artists. The Christian armies had already conquered several major Andalusian cities. From a historic point of view, the alabaster fountain in the beautifully designed Lion's Court is a real exception. In Islam, realistic depictions and illustrations of humans and animals were strictly forbidden. During the lifetime of the Sultans, the Garden of the Generalife was one of the most beautiful garden retreats in the whole of Spain. In the past, Many poets have been inspired by the splendor of this summer residence. In the years that followed the conquest of the city by the armies of the Catholic kings, the palace became somewhat neglected, a forgotten paradise. It was left to American author Washington Irving to bring the palace back to life. In his famous literary work that featured the Sultan's residence, The Tales of Alhambra, he described the flowering period of the Nazari days under Yusuf I. In the 19th century, Irving's romantic tales created a new wave of enthusiasm for the historic buildings and ignited a passion within the mind of his readers who longed for historic and exotic romance. Thus, the Alhambra became an almost mythical place. Seville, today the pulsating capital of Andalusia, is still strongly influenced by the brilliant architectural achievements of the Moors. In former times, the Real al Qadar was the residence of the region's Arabic rulers but most of these buildings were built during the reign of Pedro el Cruel, Peter the Cruel. For his fortress, that was built in Mudejar style, he sent for Moorish architects and craftsmen from Granada and Toledo. Even though the Alcazar shares certain similarities with the Alhambra, the buildings in Seville don't quite match its beauty.
from the inner courtyard of the Patio della Monteria. There's some fine filigree stucco work on the beautiful facade of this royal palace that dates back to 1366. The contrast of the occidental furnishings of the interior and the building's oriental architecture are an atmospheric and captivating sight. The magnificent rooms and halls of the Alcazar include the reception areas and private rooms of numerous Spanish monarchs. Peter the Cruel created an enchanting residence for himself and his beloved mistress Maria de Padilla, for whom he had left his legal wife. The palace gardens are an oasis of tranquility. Stylistic elements from the times of the Moors and also the Renaissance combine here most successfully. The Barrio de Santa Cruz, Seville's former Jewish district, is located beyond the northern gardens of the Alcazar and is now a favorite sightseeing destination. Most of the chalk white houses in this district possess a beautiful inner courtyard that are often decorated with colourful flowers, a typical patio, an idyllic world of Andalusian lifestyle and living culture. Santa Cruz is a well-kept and romantic city that for those who appreciate good food with a Spanish accent also offers a good range of eating places that are extremely popular. Casa de Pilatos is one of the most beautiful palatial buildings in Seville. The residence of the Dukes of Medinacelli was built between 1492 and 1520 following a pilgrimage by one of the dukes to the Holy Land. On his return journey, following the same route that the first Marques of Tarifa took through Italy, he brought back several valuable columns and fountains made of Carrara marble. Today, they adorn the beautiful exterior and gardens of the residence. Ancient treasures, Moorish ornamental art and classical forms create a wonderful architectural harmony. Along the Rio Guadalquivir is the massive yet elegant building of the Torre del Oro, the Golden Tower, built as a means of defence. Seville once possessed a trading monopoly in respect of Spain's newly discovered lands. Shipping 
became the city's most important source of income. The establishment of a stock exchange and a nautical school soon followed Seville's rapid economic growth. Toward the end of the 16th century, the city on the Guadalquivir River had a population of around 130,000. However, at the beginning of the 18th century, the wealth and influence of this, the third largest city of the Occident, came to an abrupt and unexpected end when the Spanish fleet moved its base from Seville to Cadiz, that is located on the Atlantic. Prosperous trade with the colonies of the New World now lay elsewhere, as fewer and fewer trading ships used the city's harbour, its demise was inevitable. The city's bullfight arena still shines out in all its old glory. It can accommodate almost 14,000 spectators. The Plaza de Toros is one of the country's oldest arenas. Its construction began in 1758. For Spain's bullfighters, to perform in Seville was the ultimate honour. First Aid Station and Bullfight Museum are popular attractions. The museum provides a fascinating insight into the history of this Spanish sport that still continues to draw great crowds. In 1401, when it was decided to proceed with the construction of the cathedral, no one realized what a mammoth task it would prove to be. Those who planned it wanted it to be the most magnificent church in the world. Even today, at a length of 116 metres and a width of 76, Seville Cathedral is the third largest Christian church in the world. Its huge dimensions resulted in a far longer period of construction than was anticipated at the outset. The building programme for the late Gothic monument continued into the 17th century. The result of the work that lasted for several centuries was a complete success. The first impression of the cathedral's remarkable interior is breathtaking. It was hoped that the new cathedral would surpass the former building that once stood on the same site, a great mosque of the Almohads that was believed to have contained 17 knaves. The new building was designed to make its predecessor pale into insignificance. Even today, the city's former immense wealth can be sensed within the cathedral. For the gilding of the altar, more than two and a half tons of gold leaf were used. More than 200 statues of saints decorate the altar pillars of this unique Christian monument.
in addition to its residential quarters and palaces, Seville Cathedral has its own patio known as the Orange Yard. Here and along the mighty tower of the Giralda are the remains of the Moorish Mosque. The Parque de Maria Luisa is a welcome contrast to the city's cultural monuments. Its well-arranged layout and natural vegetation is a paradise of calm. Until the end of the 19th century, the spacious park was part of the Palacio de Telmo. In 1893, the Duchess of Montpensier donated this area to Seville. During the summer months, the Parque de Luisa is a sanctuary for many of the city's inhabitants who want to escape the heat and enjoy the cooling sight of the park's numerous fountains. One of the city's favorite meeting places is the Plaza de España. It was created for the Great Ibero-American Exhibition in 1929. The base of the Spanish pavilion is decorated with numerous beautiful tiles, or azulejos, each of the country's provinces has been immortalized by an historic scene. The architecture of this dignified semicircular square was designed by Anibal Gonzalez. The pavilion is considered to be a masterpiece of neo mudeja style. The building is surrounded by two towers. Isla Magica offers a rather different glimpse into the past. This is an amusement and theme park that features historic discoveries and conquests. A small river leads to most of the attractions. The Hospital de la Caridad is popular with art lovers. Within the church, there are several great paintings by Murillo and other great masters. Believed to have been the model for the famous literary figure of Don Juan, Don Miguel de Mañana founded a welfare hospital for the sick and homeless in 1661. Today, it is an old people's home. The beautiful Baroque chapel is an historic gem and attracts many visitors to the hospital. The chapel features several impressive works of art by Valdez Leal and Pedro Roldan. The old district of La Macarena lies off the tourist trail. One of the most well-preserved sections of the historic city wall is located here. It was founded by the Almohades.
For many years, the Basilica della Macarena has contained a popular and revered statue of Mary. The statue plays an important role in the processions of Semana Santa, Holy Week. The shoreline of the Guadalquivir River in the land of Flamenco is full of life and joie de vivre. The true heart of Spain beats here in Andalusia, in the hot southern region of the Iberian Peninsula.